OK, the recording has started. Let me go ahead and share my screen. OK. Um, well, welcome. Um, <laughs> welcome, Kaiser folks and um, Smith Group. As uh, we're going to go ahead and record sort of a final walkthrough of our uh, data analytics project uh, that was associated with the um, hospital templating or acute care templating project. Um, I think it might be worthwhile just to um, introduce ourselves in two seconds um, and our role that we played on the project, uh, just so it's part of the recording. I'll go ahead and start out. Uh, my name is Stet Sanborn. I'm the engineering discipline lead in the San Francisco office, and I was the principal in charge for the project. Uh, Peter, would you like to go next? Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Peter McNally. I'm a data scientist at Smith Group. Um, I focused on a couple things on this project, uh, definitely ingesting the data, manipulating the data, um, and getting it into a form for analysis, and then also did um, some of the analysis and data visualizations for the project. Great. Uh, Eli? Hey everyone, uh, I'm Eli. I'm a data scientist, data analyst at uh, Smith Group as well. So with, along with Peter, put together some of the visual visualizations, did some of the work on diversity and a uh, little bit of the data cleaning as well. Great, thanks Eli. Um, Armin? Hi, I'm Armin Topakian. I am the discipline lead in Los Angeles and San Diego. Uh, and uh, I helped uh, the, the project team on the mechanical side with uh, ASHRAE requirements and uh, analysis of, on the project. Great, thanks Armin. Um, and absent today um, on uh, coming back from vacation is uh, Victor, um, who is also going, uh, out of the San Francisco office and is a mechanical engineer and supported Armin uh, and, and me in the uh, sort of HVAC um, sort of review side. Um, Travis, do you want to kick off um, a quick intro for the Kaiser folks? Uh, sure. My name is Travis English. I'm the, the Director of Engineering Standards for, for Kaiser Permanente. I think everyone that's on the call is on my team, but we'll let them go ahead and go down the row. Hi, my um, name is Maya Sorobashova. I'm a mechanical engineer, uh, facility, uh, facilities plant and design, Kaiser Permanente. Okay. Yes. Sandy Ramshaw, I'm a mechanical engineer with uh, NFS uh, Planning and Design. Super. This is June Timbang uh, with NFS um, Planning and Design, electrical engineer. Great. I think that's everyone. Um, we do have a, another guest watching in from Smith Group, um, Derek White, who is our um, chief technology officer and sort of oversees our uh, data analytics analytics team as well, um, so uh, from the bleacher seats. <laughs> um, so we're going to go ahead and kick off. Uh, the presentation today is going to cover um, a couple um, items. We're going to introduce the project, walk through the methodology that we used um, on the uh, sort of how we handled the data. Uh, there's a, quite a large data set um, that you'll hear about. The preliminary analysis that we did, and then we'll review some of the uh, results relative to individual zone type peaks. Uh, peak cooling loads, as well as um, block loads, uh, what we'd call a sort of a specific block load, and then um, a first stab at trying to understand diversity within certain zone types. At the final part of the presentation, we are going to sort of go through where we see this project could go in the future um, if uh, Kaiser decides to keep it going um, or to grab chunks for future work, um, because now that we have a really large data set, there's a lot of opportunities to get uh, more value out of the work that's that's been done. So I'm going to go ahead and kick it off with the project introduction, and this will be relatively quick. Um, this project was born out of the templating project uh, that Smith Group uh, was also engaged in with uh, with Kaiser, uh, looking at um, acute care facilities uh, and sort of designing the template uh, hospital of the future. Part of that analysis um, sort of dove into um, trying to identify sort of best in class uh, future systems for different zone types. <clears throat> um, in this case, I, this is an illustration of one of the uh, diagrams that we looked at uh, for an air tunnel system uh, serving ORs. Um, 
And that analysis was really trying to compare a bunch of different options, including uh, looking at uh, sort of a clean room strategy, air tunnel, or traditional um, sort of VAV approach to um, the rooms. And as we are going through this analysis and trying to understand what systems might um, have the best sort of efficiency, easiest install, cost, maintenance, et cetera, one of the big questions that we were coming across um, was how to right size the upstream distribution systems. Even if we take face value load calcs, um, different systems, as you can see here in this diagram, resulted in uh, different upstream shaft sizing uh, that could be serving uh, the, or for total air serving the different OR types. Um, but uh, Travis and uh, the sort of Kaiser team also posed the question, well, what are the real loads that we uh, should be designing for, um, as opposed to just using sort of off the shelf standard sort of ASHRAE design calcs? Um, and that sort of sparked this whole uh, transition of rather than looking at um, our design calcs of trying to look at historic data. Um, and one of the really big questions that we had was as we stack up the number of rooms, what's the real level of diversity that we think that we could take on those upsized or upstream systems um, and ultimately up to the chiller plant, the boiler plant um, and shaft sizing um, and even air handlers that are serving those spaces. Um, and without data, that those questions are really hard to answer, which I think is why uh, historically projects have defaulted to um, using sort of des uh, standard design calcs. What we uh, were able to do as part of this project, and there's going to be a lot more information as we move through the next sections, um, we were able to grab a tremendous amount of data from several um, uh, different hospitals throughout California and able to actually start to look at what are the real loads that are that we are actually seeing um, over several over a number of years, um, and how does that compare to the design loads? So that was kind of our, our the start of our question. Um, as the project went through, we started to try to ask a few more questions of the data, um, and as I mentioned at the end, we have some more ideas of where this uh, project could go. Um, so with that. focus at the beginning was just looking at the San Leandro Medical Center. Um, this is uh, just sort of south of Oakland, very marine climate, um, sort of very modest. And one of the uh, big questions that was coming up as part of our analysis was, would we see a big difference um, if we looked at any uh, locations that were a little bit more extreme? And so um, because we had the methodology uh, that you're going to hear about shortly uh, defined, we are able to pretty rapidly pull in data uh, from three additional sites, two more hospitals, and another MOB. Uh, so Modesto, Riverside Kirby, and South Bay Medical Center um, in Southern California. Um, this allowed us to do some cross site analysis um, as well as get a larger data set um, for certain room types that only occur uh, in limited numbers per hospital. Um, so right now, the, the analysis only focuses on California uh, facilities. But the methodology uh, could be expanded to look at um, other states that Kaiser has um, active operations in uh, for future analysis. Um, something else that um, sort of is a good baseline to begin understanding is, um, you know, we're trying to compare as part of this analysis, we're comparing design loads that the design engineers um, had for certain room types and certain facilities and comparing that against actual data. Uh, and load that we measured. Uh, one of the questions that came up during the peer review process, um, and I believe we had four firms that uh, provided peer review comments throughout this process, um, is trying to look at, well, you know, the design engineers are using an ASHRAE design day um, or design hour um, for their analysis, and what, how did those temperatures, the design day temperatures, uh, relate to actual uh, measured uh, temperatures on site, and could that be a source of uh, some variation or uh, difference between the design loads and what we're experiencing? Um, in general, we, gen we saw that the actual weather station on site, um, as well as uh, we verified this against weather stations adjacent to um, or nearby um, the actual hospitals, so not just the facility data, but we also uh, checked that against uh, weather stations, th the closest one we could find. And in general, all of the sites were actually experiencing higher temperatures on their peak day um, uh, than, and their same 0.4% criteria 
um, they're experiencing significantly higher temperatures than what ASHRAE design days would include. Um, so we wouldn't expect, because of that data, we wouldn't expect the loads to be lower uh, than the design uh, engineer's uh, design load. Um, but it, uh, it's just one thing to sort of to show that um, if the loads were lower that we actually measured, it's not because the outside air conditions were um, more favorable. Uh, in all cases, the peak uh, days were actually um, higher than what the design engineer would have designed to. Um, so we're going to jump into the, the methodology section, uh, and I think um, Peter's going to jump in and start talking through um, sort of the process of how we handled uh, quite a bit of data. Thanks, Stet. Yeah, exactly. It was definitely a process. So this section is going to that analysis as long as as well as um, looking at some of the initial analysis that we did. As Stet mentioned, it started out with just a single facility, the San Leandro Hospital. Um, and then we were over the course of the project, uh, it kind of grew and we were able to expand that uh, time permitting to to four facilities. So um, this slide shows uh, really the core of the data. There's uh, sensor data that we received from the Clockworks building automation system uh, provided at five minute intervals. And that, as I said, grew to four different facilities, um, a total of 827 zones and comprising um, over 84 million records. This is just an example of one of the CSVs that we received. Um, the key columns are highlighted, so there's that, that timestamp field uh, every five minutes for the entire um, year of, uh, in this case, it shows 20, 2020 data was really the, the period of analysis that we looked at. Um, and then, so just the, the zone supply airflow rate, the zone air temp, and then the room air temp. So those are the three columns that we use to uh, derive the load calculation, uh, which we'll see in the next slide. So here are, are two different visualizations of really kind of the same data. Uh, the top one shows that, that five minute interval data, and this is um, just one month, July of 2020, um, and looking at the load. So each one of those bars, this is a bar chart, so is showing that five minute interval data, and there are no simultaneous um, measurements here. So uh, on the top, kind of on the positive part of the Y, data uh, for a single zone in San Leandro, we see there's just kind of rapid flipping back and forth between heating and cooling. And this was one of really the early insights that we saw and surprises when actually looking at this data. Uh, it, this frankly wasn't anticipated. It was kind of thought that that would be like a heating period and then a cooling period. And again, this is July. So looking at um, at least for this one particular zone, um, there's still a lot a uh, patient zone. There's a, a lot of heating that was occurring in July. So one way we, we thought about this and dealing with this was, you know, five minutes really granular. Let's uh, let's aggregate this up and show this net hourly load BTU um, on, on that graph on the bottom. So that, that chart shows same data, same zone, same location, but aggregated up to the hourly level. So there's it's either heating or cooling. And to do that, we just took the average load across that hour. And here you see like something more of what you'd expect in general. There's like the, there's heating periods and there's cooling periods, um, and it just made the made more sense to deal with the data in this manner. So this is what we did um, for really the the rest of the analysis. Uh, so again, a San Le San preliminary analysis showing San Leandro patient zones, and this is the average cooling load by hour. One thing that kind of stood out is those gray areas that uh, that we have ultimately filtered out. So this is um, in the winter months um, in the, on both sides, I guess. Um, January through April and then uh, November and December. Um, those showed what we again, something we didn't maybe anticipate was that higher than normal cooling levels for uh, colder months. Um, so we decided to filter those out and really focus on um, May through October, that six month period of analysis. And can, one of the things that we, we saw is that the reason that these averages were higher, that there were there were some zones that were really throwing this off and that were uh, cooling during periods when it was a little bit surprising. Um, so it was just kind of 
unexpected and probably a controls issue that we really didn't want to uh, delve into for this analysis. So looking at the next slide, this, is, this shows that, again, that, that average cooling load by hour of the month. Um, so this is very similar to the data that was, was shown before, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the similarities and what, what we, we got from here. So if you look at that, the, this, this chart is a heat map. So uh, the x-axis there is the month of the year, the y-axis is the hour of the day. So each cell there shows the average cooling load for patient zones for an hour uh, in that month. So it, it, looking at the upper left-hand corner and the, um, the lower left-hand corner, you see these this highest average levels. And again, this is January through March and in, in the early morning hours and then maybe in the late evening hours. So this is talking a bit about what was happening to in, in, in the previous slide when you saw these higher average um, loads in these zones. Um, just a few zones are really driving these these higher levels. Um, and then we so this has also helped inform us. This wasn't the sole reason that we looked at it, but uh, we filtered the data, and this was a good I thought visualization would show maybe why we did that. Um, but part of the reason we did that uh, to only look at the the core hours that we wanted to look at. So in addition to just fil filtering on May through October, we also just looked at 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. for the analysis. And Peter, I might jump in. One of the, mm -hmm. the issues uh, when we were starting looking at and we diet, dove into like these individual zones. And again, this is a perimeter zone in San Leandro. We would not expect the zone to have its annual peak cooling in at 1 a.m. in January. When we actually went into the five minute increment data, raw data and followed it through, we saw this sort of rapid over reheat. So the reheat um, um, sort of hunting for this, the room set point was way overheating the space and then the cooling would have to come back in and compensate and we didn't think that was representative of how the actual cooling performance should be um, and because it was isolated to a number of the units so um, that's sort of what drove uh, the filtering that peter was mentioning yeah thanks Seth. so that early analysis was just kind of preliminary it was only done with with a few files um, so th this slide talks about how we grew that out to to scale it out to those um, ultimately those 800 plus zones across the locations with you know tens of millions of records. So on the left side there in that source box is is that that Clockworks BAS cloud data. Um, we received that data in CSV format. There's there's two things that we were able to get from that. Uh, the top one shows that that outside air temp. So that was helpful to have that. that we, were, we were then able to uh, tie in to the um, ultimately tie in with the measurement data and that's that second csv file those are those five minute um, uh, values and we received those for um, all 827 zones so individual files for each one of those and then in, in addition to that that's just really the sensor data and it really just looks like that table that i showed earlier um, but we needed to connect that to the actual information about those zones um, even like what type of zone they were um, and then um, the square footage of the zone, the design loads and things like that. And that was something that was provided from um, uh, Kaiser Permanente staff and given to us. And um, in that middle section there, really Microsoft Teams functioned as the repository for us. And it was uh, it turned out to be a, a really nice way to be able to share things back and forth. Uh, the KP team put things in there. We kind of those dotted lines towards the right. We shared information back to them as well. So that was really where we uh, traded information and, and shared some results. Um, the actual heart of the uh, the manipulation of the data was done in a, in a platform called Databricks, and I'll go into that um, in uh, uh, subsequent slides. But that's a it's a cloud platform that uh, Smith Group uses as our big data solution. It allows us to manipulate data, to analyze data, and to do quite a, a few different things. Um, in, a, in addition to that, and the, the, we will, or we used uh, Python and Power BI, so those are two different tools, um, the, both uh, desktop tools that we used to um, analyze the data, to visualize the data, and to perform some statistics on that. And then again, we kind of fed some of those results back in uh, to teams throughout the process. <laughs> 
So moving on to the next slide, just talking about what some of those uh, different tools are. So as mentioned, Databricks, that's a, it's a cloud platform, allows for data storage and visualization. Um, really a great tool for manipulating and processing data and allows you to scale it up really quickly to huge data sets on demand. Um, it's a tool that we really like at Smith Group. Just uh, a couple of the, the languages that it supports is uh, SQL, Python, and R. Um, and this is all done kind of within a notebook framework that uh, allows really rapid um, development. Power BI, Power BI is a Microsoft product. I know the KP team is familiar with that. Um, it provides the ability to do some statistical analysis and data visualization, certainly. Um, it's really nice that it has some pre-configured options, um, so you can kind of drag and drop, and it's, it's a fairly an intuitive tool. You can kind of hit the ground running, low barrier to entry. But the, it, there are some things that are less customizable on it, um, and that's just kind of the nature of the tool. Uh, looking at Python, it does some of the similar things to uh, a Power BI, uh, allows for statistical analysis, data visualization. Um, it's much more fl flexible and more customizable, though. Um, so you can kind of get a little more creative or push in certain directions um, as you see fit. And the next slide, I think, will provide an example of that. So on the uh, on the right there, you can see already there's movement. So there's this is just a short video showing some interaction. This is something that Eli created, um, showing the histogram of uh, San Leandro patient rooms and adjusting the uh, maximum percentile there. Uh, this is you know a nice uh, interface and just kind of a demonstration of of what you could do and what the results would be, um, and then compared to just. If Steph, if you want to go back for just for a moment, that that one on the left there is just a similar example of uh, Steph showed this already, and this is just kind of a static histogram. You could put a selector on there if you wanted to to show a different zone, but it wouldn't wouldn't allow you to kind of play um, hit or hit a play button or really uh, interactively move those lines or things like that. So um, definitely just just an example of why you might want to use Python over Power BI or some of that uh, additional functionality that provides. So um, I just want to spend a little bit of time on Databricks here, just again, since there was really a lot of time, I spent a lot of time on this, and this was really kind of the heart of that uh, data manipulation engine, if you will, and uh, also you just might not be familiar with it since it's a newer tool. So this is kind of the home screen that you see. Um, it's a it's a browser-based tool, so I think uh, um, using Chrome in this example and just kind of log in with our, uh, our credentials and really don't use this screen too much, but you can see uh, um, there's a lot of there's notebooks that you can create and, then, and the next slide shows an example of one of those. So this is kind of the notebook uh, interface um, on the left. You can see just kind of a nice, easy way uh, the, the different titles there is kind of provides a, a table of contents and allows you to see the different steps in the process. And just wanted to show an example of you know using different um, Different commands and writing it to a data frame. Um, it's under the curtains, leveraging or under the covers, leveraging something called Spark, which is a uh, um, big data compute engine. And you can again, you can use Python, which I'm using in this case. Um, you can even use like Bash, which uh, I did in that first cell there, and use a, a couple different languages. Moving to the next slide. So this shows an example, and you can't see the code there, but I'm actually using R in this case. Just again, it's a Python notebook, but you can switch to another language, switch to R, switch back to Python, go to SQL, really whatever makes sense for that portion of the analysis. And then on the right there, that's uh, the data visualization of that histogram that I developed in Databricks uh, using R. And then it's easy to export these images and then include in a presentation, for example. So going to the next slide, this is a little bit more in depth um, about really what we did in terms of uh, processing the data. So um, it's kind of thinking back, there's there's three different um, input data sources. The top one there is that zone attribute data. Uh, so that was provided to us in an Excel sheet, which I kind of read in as a, a CSV uh, file and then did some, some processing that data just to ensure that there were consistent column names and data types. We'll have kind of like a side note here. This data was kind of it was you know it was manually put together, and it was a, a lot of work from the uh, KP team to to do this. 
this is one of the there was some data cleansing that I did kind of outside of this process just to kind of remove some typos and um, make sure commas were in the right places and things like that that uh, wasn't fully automated but once it was in in, in good form within in Databricks uh, I was able to integrate it into this process and then jumping down to the, the bottom part of that temperature data that was the other uh, uh, another uh, data that we were uh, given and, and that was kind of a smaller simpler data set um, one for each location and read that temperature data csv file into databricks just not too much processing there just ensuring that the timestamps were in the correct format so that we could join it to the sensor data and then aggregated that data up um, to an hourly level since that was the unit of analysis so most of oh just i was Going back there, most of that just to talk through, I won't, won't go through each one of these steps, but definitely most of the processing and, and manipulation occurred in that center part and that sensor data. And there was, you know, some pre-processing steps about the loading and appending it to a single file, adding some additional columns in there again with timestamps and doing some manipulations on those date time columns. Um, and then ultimately joining it with those other two uh, files and aggregating it up to at the zone level and the hour level um, and really that then writing that into like a, a gold storage table that was really like the source of truth for this project and inserting it into um, ultimately the all zones location table so each one of these was done for each of the four locations so then we were able to put everything in just a single table that we were able to hit for our analysis so um, that was pretty convenient. We didn't have to have multiple files to bring into Power BI or into Python. We could just either hit it directly using Power BI or export it um, and use Python for that. Thanks, Peter. So before we wanted, uh, before we started working towards the uh, the kind of final goal of of coming up with um, like a final number for each zone type. We wanted to take a look at some of the other aspects of our data. Um, you get a next slide set. Um, so like Peter mentioned, is our, is our data clean and consistent? Um, we, we looked at some of the quantitative aspects, um, such as the fact that the summer months might have uh, better data, less, um, less sensor errors. Uh, but we wanted to look at some of the qualitative aspects too. Um, Peter mentioned that that uh, zone legend coming in was was manly input, so just making sure that certain rooms were assigned to the correct zones and, and things like that. Um, we wanted to make sure that we were accounting for any other factors that might correlate to that final coiling load as opposed to just assuming that it was the zone type making all the difference. And um, there are certain measurements that we, we wanted to look at that um, require normality, so we wanted to take a look at, at the normality of our data um, for things like standard deviation and and be able to adjust accordingly. So we started off by looking at um, the area of different zones and, and, and different rooms within those zones. So on the far left, we've got um, a whole list of, of a bunch of different zone types that we found in our in our data for San Leandro. And then right next to it is the room that is uh, generally most associated with that zone. It's the room that the thermostat where we're pulling all our all of our BAS data. Um, it's, it's the room that that's located in. And so then we were able to look at the area of those rooms with that had the thermostat and look at the total area of the zones and, and make sure that those thermostat rooms were representative of the data. And so the good news is that a, is that a good majority of the zones that we are prioritizing um, we see operating rooms, ICU patient rooms are all are all in that green down there. Um, so, for example, in patient room zones, the thermostat was almost always in the patient room itself, and that patient room would take up about 85% of the area for the patient room zone. I believe the other 15% was uh, usually just a bathroom connected to that patient room. And then if we zoom in on the red area, uh, even in this case, uh, some some of those numbers look a little a little bit scary, but um, are are maybe not all bad. So, for example, the the lobby zone type there just might there's there's just a, diff a couple different kinds of lobbies, so to speak. Um, so, the thermostat for zones designated as a lobby was generally the elevator lobby, whereas uh, the max the the 
most common room type within those lobby zones was just a lobby as opposed to an elevator lobby. So even though that 13% is showing up for the primary uh, room type, um, a lot of the area within those lobby zones was still just other types of lobbies, and that's not going to create too much of a difference. Um, on, on the other hand, something that uh, we might want to take a further, further look at in the future is um, critical care patient stations, where uh, most of the time the thermostat um, where we were getting all of our data would be in a nurse station, and that nurse station in this case is taking up an average of only about 20% of that critical care zones area, whereas 45% is taken up by a corridor. And so we, we might uh, look further into the data um, and, and question why these, these corridors are, are being labeled as the critical care zone type. So if you go to the next slide step, um, next we wanted to look uh, so so a lot of our patient rooms were um, on the outside in these in these patient towers were outward facing facades like Peter mentioned earlier. Um, and so we one one aspect that we thought might affect uh, our our final outcomes in cooling loads was um, the direction and, and solar loads and, and temperatures that might be coming into these uh, outwards facing perimeter zones. So in this map here, we've got um, San Leandro as an example. It's, it's rotated uh, on a little bit of an odd angle. So we've got we've got a bunch of different directions here. So um, the south southeast and south southwest facades uh, being on the inside of that corridor are uh, subject to self shading, and so there's there's a little bit of um, interesting change in the numbers there that that gets that gets caused by the fact that uh, even though those are southern facing facades, they might not be getting as much uh, as much solar load as some of the eastern ones because they're they're shaded by other parts of the buildings, and and even though um, the majority of these facades are, are part of the the patient towers and have patient zones in them, the the uh, the very top corner and very bottom corner, the east northeast and west southwest facades uh, actually don't have any patient rooms in them. So. A uh, quick little intro on confidence intervals. We've got um, a little dot in the middle there, and that is the mean of our sample um, for, for all the data we have for each of these little categories. And then those kind of wings that are coming off of it is, um, is what's called a confidence interval. So we can be, uh, the, the, the stats phrase is we can be 99% sure that the quote true mean, so the mean of uh, you know all of the data at San Leandro as opposed to just the data that we looked at, we can be 99% sure that that mean is is within that range um, around the the mean of the data that we looked at. Uh, and so, first we we took a look at these these facades and we we separated them by patient rooms, or we separated the patient rooms out and then um, looked at all of the zones as a whole. And so the first thing you notice is that east northeast and west southwest tend to have a lot higher cooling by uh, BTUH per square foot. Um, but the issue with that is, is if you look at those uh, blue confidence intervals on the bottom, the ones that in, include patient rooms, is that patient rooms tend uh, tend to in our data have have a lower mean um, have a lower mean cooling load. And so even though those east northeast and west southwest facades have higher cooling, it's it's most likely because of the fact that those facades don't include any patient rooms to to bring that mean down. Um, and additionally, even if you look just at the zones that include, if just at the patient room zones uh, that have the outward facing facades, the uh, the two that are slightly higher in cooling load are, are east, southeast and north to northwest, which are the two that I mentioned earlier, do not have the self shading. And so those are the ones that are going to be uh, receiving a little bit more direct sunlight, even though they're not the southern facing zones. But uh, even so, they're still maybe only one one to two um, BTUH per square foot over the, the other patient room zones. And so the, the bigger takeaway is that zone type is, is that well, there there might be a little bit of a factor um, from from solar load and from facade direction. The uh, the zone type is generally a bigger factor in in that final cooling load than the facade direction is. So we went about a, a very similar process for outside air temperature. Um, again, most of the data that we're looking at is is during the day and and in the summer, um, but we still wanted to make sure 
that there's not a, a huge difference between, say, a 70 degree uh, cooler day and a, and a 95 degree day, um, maybe in the middle of August at 5 p.m. So we see a very uh, interesting pattern to start off with, and that's that all of the interior zones have a much higher uh, cooling load on average than the perimeter zones. But again, that's because of those uh, patient columns, patient room columns. We've got a vast majority of those perimeter zones are patient room zones. And, and again, that's uh, dragging down that mean data because of the zone type rather than the fact that they're interior or exterior zones. So if we look at the 60 to 80 degree range, you can see that there is a little bit of a correlation there. But again, it's it's relatively small. It's bringing up the it's bringing up the BTUH per square foot that cooling load by maybe about one one and a half um, BTUH per square foot um, total across the that twenty degree range. And then as you get further and you have less data, those those confidence intervals get a less get a lot wider, um, which means we're we're less sure about where that uh, quote true mean might actually lie. Um, and so even though there is a little bit of correlation between that 60 and 80 degree range, it's it's very difficult to um, make an interpretation beyond that and to um, try to figure out or try, try to interpret what what that temperature might mean at, at much higher uh, outlier levels. Um, and so again, the, the bigger table takeaway is that while there there is a slight impact um, by by outside air temperature, the, the main factor affecting the cooling load here is the uh, zone type and and that's what's bringing those perimeter zones down is the fact that there's a lot of patient rooms there so normality um we initially wanted to look at standard deviations to to describe our outliers to try to describe our um extreme extreme cooling loads um these are the the cooling loads that we're most worried about um we we know our we know our systems, our, our HVAC systems can cover those kind of normal, more mild days, but we're, we're worried about um, those uh, those crazy, crazy uh, climate change days that we're moving towards that might have 100 degree days and, and those outliers. Um, but standard deviations are, are only an accurate way of approximating those outliers if our data follows an approximately normal distribution. Um, so in this little image on the right, we've got a mean represented by mu in the middle, and then each of those lines is one standard deviation above or below that mean, um, represented by plus or minus one sigma, two sigma, et cetera. Um, so if you go to next slide set, we, we wanted to look at um, one way to measure the normality of our data is a, it's what's called a quantile quantile or QQ plot. And so on that uh, top image, we've got another image of, of what some normally distributed data might look like. Um, and a quantile quantile plot, a QQ plot, will graph the quantiles of your data against the quantiles of some approximately normal theoretical data. And so in that top right corner, you can see that that becomes a straight line if you have normally distributed data as it's going to match up with the theoretical normal data. Whereas on the bottom, we see um, a QQ plot from one of our patient zones uh, and, and the histogram for, for that zone where you can see that it's not very normal data. And the QQ plot um, shows that as well, where it, it, it may follow uh, the quantiles of normal data a little bit in the middle, but it, it kind of tails off as you reach the end. Um, and so we know that our data isn't exactly normally distributed. Um, it's it's skewed off to to one side or the other. It's um, and and so therefore we wanted to to look for a different measure rather than standard deviation to to try to measure our our extremes. Um, so fortunate for us, uh, ASHRAE has actually run into similar issues with some of its data as well. And so ASHRAE uses percentages to ensure quote the same probability of occurrence regardless of the seasonal distribution of extreme temperatures. So we decided to go ahead and do the same thing. Um, we decided to look at percentages uh, as opposed to standard deviations for our data. Um, and you can see that 83.9 in the uh, Oakland International Airport data from ASHRAE is, is the same as um, what Stet showed us earlier, uh, is that 0.4% exceedance rate for uh, for temperature for what, what ASHRAE is predicting for 
uh, for the San Leandro area. Um, and so we're going to look at two things here real quick. Um, the first is a PDF or a probability distribution function, and that uh, in, in this case, for an example, normal distribution, it kind of just looks like what your histogram um, looks like. It'll tell you the probability that a, a given value uh, would show up in your data. So for example, right in the middle, if you look at uh, the theoretical value of 10, would show up about 8% of the time in, a, in this normal curve. And if you look at the CDF, which is what we're more interested in, this is a cumulative distribution function. So that 10 lines up with right about 50% on that CDF. Uh, and that means that half the data is gonna be below that 10 and half is gonna be above. And so what we're interested in is looking at that 0.4% exceedance. So way over by where that 30 might be. And that's going to be 99.6% of our data is lower than this and 0.4% is above this. So if you hop to the next slide step, we've got patient room data from uh, every zone across all of our sites that we had patient room data for. Um, and we've got that CDF plotted on top of a histogram and then a, a black that black line coming down is that 0.4% exceedance rate for all of our uh, patient room data. And so we can see that 30.1 BTUH per square foot is that exceedance rate. And so 99.6% of our data is below that and only 0.4% of uh, all of the patient room data that we looked at uh, exceeded that, that 30.1 BTUH per square foot. Um, and we did have questions about one more thing. I'm gonna hand this off to Peter in a second, um, but there were, there were questions early on in the process from our peer reviewers about um, the fact that 2022 was an abnormal year, especially for hospitals um, and how, how COVID might have uh, impacted some of the results that we saw. Yeah, just to talk about this a little bit, just so thanks Eli. Um, just that, that this, this is just a comparison between 2020 and 2019. So we took a subset of the zones, um, just nine patient zones in San Leandro. Um, and that data on the left shows a histogram, um, just the count of hours by these cooling load bins. Um, so you can see, like Eli was saying, this is right skewed data. It's not normal, but you can still compute a mean for that and saw the mean value for that was 1185 BTUH. Um, then looking at this comparatively on the right side, um, same time period, you know, May through October, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., which is the year was 2019, same nine zones. Um, the, Data looks uh, fairly similar, similar patterns, right skewed. Um, in this case, I did look a, a little more in depth and there's kind of a single zone that was causing that, that second peak just to the right of the mean. But even so, you see a really similar mean value of uh, 1282, so within 100 BTUH. Um, so this showed, you know, there wasn't a drastic difference um, between uh, the means or the shape of the data for, the, for this, uh, the, at least this preliminary analysis showed didn't show that so um, we you know felt confident that the, the 2020 data was representative um, uh, was a representative year even though it was you know a COVID year was one of the motivations that we wanted to look at 2019. So moving into the next section of the results the uh, peak cooling load so we're going to go a little more in depth into the calculations that um, we generated for uh, peak cooling load and I'll explain that um, next. So this should look pretty pretty familiar. Um, just looking at this slide, the, the, this is kind of like a little math interlude here. So sensible cooling load, um, it's 1.0H times CFM times delta T, and that, that shows you where the 1.0H constant, 1.08 constant came from. Uh, it depends on on altitude, and we're kind of very near sea level, so we're able to use that value. And then the, the CFM is just that zone hourly. Uh, or the zone supply rate and the, the delta T is just the, the zone supply air temp minus the room air temp. Uh, and then uh, I guess to, just to mention too that, that this is just um, um, the sensible cooling load, so there's there's no latent loads as well. Go ahead, Steph. Yeah, I just want to jump in on the one of the key things in a, in a few room types is that we wanted to just flag is that we're not capturing any supplemental cooling loads. Um, that might be picked up, and this could be for, um, especially in imaging um, type suites, you know, MRI, et cetera, that might have standalone um, sort of independent, either water cooled um, or other localized cooling that's not being picked up at the at the box. Uh, so um, the data that we have 
in some of those zones uh, may need an additional analysis for imaging to make sure that we're that we would uh, capture total uh, total cooling load from the equipment. This slide goes a little more in depth into how we um, generated that it went from the five minute data up to our, our normalized data that we were going to talk about um, in, in the next slide and in, in that Eli also indicated. Um, thinking back to some previous slides that I, that I showed, this was all pretty much done in Databricks. So this is one of the things that we did there. So starting with the first step, we just calculated that five minute sensible load um, using that equation from the previous step. Um, and then we aggregated that up. So again, looking at thinking about that, that slide that I showed that showed the blue and the red for the cooling and the heating. This is that process to aggregate that up. And that's just to look at for each hour um, the average load. So we calculated that load in step one and step two. We just took the average of those and you know at the zero zero minute, the zero five minute, and then all the way up through the uh, the fifty five minute and um, to get the cooling load, we just again we just looked at wherever that was less than zero. So given the uh, the delta T above, um, the cooling was less than zero when the, the uh, uh, control air temp was greater than the supply air temp. And then we also kind of threw out some data if it didn't meet a, th uh, meet a threshold of having at least uh, nine five minute intervals. You know anything less than that, um, we decided that we just didn't need to look at that data. Just there weren't enough signals there. We also uh, calculated the normal, normalized sensible cooling load by normalized by room area. So we, we did this both with uh, BTUH uh, per square foot as well as watts per meter squared, and then uh, calculated the peak normalized cooling load using those exceedance values um, that Eli spoke about earlier. So we did this for you know each each hour, each zone. Um, and to do that, uh, as a result of that, that we were generated, we generated this table, which was really kind of one of the key deliverable deliverables for this project. So just to go through this a little bit, um, each row here is a different zone type. Um, patient zones is definitely what we started with, and then expanded that um, as we got more data and went through these kind of sequentially. Um, and then uh, also looking at the sample counts, so the, the total sample size is indicated there as well as the uh, constituent facilities that made that up. So uh, patient zones, patient room zones had, had the highest count, 67, and we had three different facilities. We were able to get data for that, so we're pretty confident in those numbers. Um, some of these other ones have fewer facilities, but we still um, felt that the data, we had a, a threshold that we were able to meet with at least a half dozen uh, sample size zones for these. And then over on the right, those right five columns shows the uh, those sensible cooling loads, uh, both in BTUH per square foot as well as watts per meter squared. There's two values for each cell, and then those exceedance levels. So, um, going from the 20, 75 percent exceedance levels um, all the way up to that 0.4 uh, percent exceedance levels. Um, really, also kind of on this one, I want you to kind of focus on that, that 50 percent exceedance. That's that median value. So at, at that point, there's kind of 50 percent of the data is above that, and 50 percent of that is below. Um, it's it's a, a key value that uh, to kind of keep in mind, and don't just look at the all the way to the right. Those those you know 0.4 percent exceedance levels get pretty high. Um, even so, this is a lot of data to look at. So one of the looking at the next slide, I'm going to show um, what we thought was a nice visualization is this uh, a violin plot. And if you're not familiar with it, the slide kind of walks you through a little bit. It's similar to a box plot, which you may be familiar with. Um, but in addition to um, showing the shape of the data with the medians and the quartiles, um, a violin plot also shows you the shape of the data in terms of the frequency of the distribution. So um, those those um, very high points is that that's that right tail and that right skew that uh, some of the uh, graphs that Eli was showing uh, indicated. So there's only a few values there, but it really drags out that distribution. And that's again looking at those, you know, 0.4% exceedance values. Those are those values way out there. Um, so definitely there's fewer cases there, and that's indicated just by that thinner line. Um, then the the dash line in the middle, that's that median line that I was talking about. So um, that's where 50 percent above is 50 and there's 50 percent below and then the the two dotted lines there are those um quartile lines so the 25 percent and 75 percent quartile lines so moving to the next slide that we, uh, this shows uh, it doesn't show every one of those previous uh records in in the table but it shows uh, a selection of them and you 
I mean, in some cases, the, you look at these and say, wow, they're wildly different. But again, this is like the this is these right tails. So um, looking for a moment at just like those dashed and dotted lines, those actually cluster pretty closely together there for the majority of the data. These zones uh, look pretty similar, um, slightly different shapes, but then those uh, those extreme values are, are, you know, I mean, we wouldn't want to throw those out because they exist and we calculated those, but just kind of keep in mind that those aren't characteristic of that zone as a whole. Um, it's just one um, measure of the data and really looking at those central tendencies that the data does seem to cluster pretty well. Um, and Peter, I might just add, you know, as part of um, as part of when we talk about next steps and sort of the impact of what does this, all this data mean? You know, one of the key things uh, that Kaiser could begin to move into is sort of a database based commissioning um, uh, strategy or retro commissioning strategy. These plots can be extremely useful by highlighting zones that have sort of these extreme outliers with very little frequency, um, because that may actually uh, be a signal that you might have a control issue um, at that at a zone that's driving these extreme peaks. Whereas if we look at procedure rooms, for instance, from the data set, we have a very tight clustering, uh, which would be expected for um, a, a room that has that schedule. It's an interior zone, et cetera. Um, but some of these other uh, spaces, we might not expect to have these sort of extremes. So this, these types of plots could be used um, for future work uh, to be handed to a commissioning, a retro commissioning agent and say, hey, you know, we've prioritized the zones that we'd like you to first take a look at that we think from a data standpoint have a controls issue. Um, so it's it's not just useful for our analytics today from a sizing standpoint, but actually these could be really useful tools for a retro commissioning um, project. Great. Instead, I think this is your section, if, if I recall. Is it? Uh, yeah, if, you, think, if you'd like to just give a quick intro to the sure. to block load and then I can, I can walk through it. Yeah, yeah, I think Eli is going to walk through the analysis, okay. but I wanted to give a brief intro as to like what we're uh, doing. So one of the uh, things that we wanted to take a look at um, was how to make this information actionable uh, to sort of future uh, design engineers. And that's a that was sort of a big um, ask from um, Kaiser is to start to think about, well, OK, how do we implement? How do we take what we've learned and make it into something useful? Um, so what we started to do is look at these individual zone types that are clustered. So, you know, um, uh, patient rooms, for instance, ORs, et cetera, um, and look at well, what are the block loads? If we just take that zone type, what are the block loads that we start to run into as we aggregate the number of zones and look at what the coincident peak is? Um, and this is, so it's not a true block load because uh, like what the air handler sees uh, because we haven't combined patient rooms and OR or patient rooms and corridor and what else might all be on the same distribution uh, from an air handler standpoint. But we are starting to look at what is the block load and then later on the diversity that we could expect as we aggregate these uh, uh, number of zones um, within a certain zone type, uh, because uh, we are a little bit surprised <laughs> um, at the at the values that we got. Um, and Eli is going to sort of walk through that calculation um, and then I'll walk through the diversity values that sort of were born out of that and sort of talk about sort of the key takeaways that we think might be taken taken forward. Right. OK, so thank you, Seth, to to calculate um, the block loads here uh, again, just just by zone type, not by not by what the air handler seeing. Um, we we took for for each individual hour, we looked at uh, the maximum n number of of highest uh, highest cooling zones for that hour. Um, and we added up all of their uh, BTU H's and, and we got we got a total sum BTU H for that hour uh, for that zone type. And then we looked at which zones those those were that were cooling in that hour, and we added up all of their areas. Um, and we, so we got a normalized maximum block cooling load by zone type for each hour. Um, and so if we if we look at this slide, this is plotting um, for San Leandro by by each of those zone types, and then by uh, the amount of zones that were cooling in a given hour. This is what the maximum block load we saw was. Um, and so you can see there's there's generally a, a downwards trend. Um, and, you know, I, I, if we start way at the top, um, it looks like break rooms and nurseries and imaging uh, zones um, around around one zone all had. Uh, all had about 50 BTUH per square foot. Um, 
in, in their maximum hour. So the, the maximum that one zone saw for those three zone types was about 50 BTUH per square foot. But as as we go down, um, we can see the the brown, the nurse stations all the way at at 13 zones. Um, the, the normalized block value for for those. Uh, sorry, nurseries. Um, ended up dropping all the way down to 20 BTUH per per square foot, uh, even just in the maximum hour when we had 13 nursery zones running as opposed to just one or two. Uh, if you go to the next the next couple slides, um, these these both just show the same chart, but um, just a little bit more readable. We've we've broken it up into zones that had uh, less than 10 zones cooling and then zones that had more than 10 zones cooling just to make it a little bit more legible, have less lines crisscrossing all over each other. And so here's that greater than 10. Yeah, and so we can definitely see like um, some of these, uh, you know, spaces where there may have seen one zone, you know, in isolation had a really large load, but definitely as you start to aggregate them. And again, this is looking at this graph is looking at, you know, for instance, if I look at a zone count of six, we scoured the data for the highest coincident six zones, and that's the data that's reported here. Um, so. Uh, this in itself as a graph is quite conservative. Um, if you were to take this and sort of apply it going forward and saying, hey, here's an anticipated low uh, peak load uh, for if I only had a, um, a block load of six patient rooms, uh, because again, out of all of our you know 20 some patient rooms, uh, this is this data is representing the highest coincidence six zones and it's their block load. Uh, so it's not necessarily the block load that an air handler uh, would begin to see it. So it's still on the conservative side from a load standpoint. Um, and so that kind of feeds into this idea of uh, diversity factors and being able to talk to uh, a design team and say, you know, are there are there values that could um, that we could apply uh, to um, to a project? And so uh, what we did is we went ahead and it's very similar to uh, that uh, the previous graph. Uh, or, or calculation where we're looking at that coincident block load. Uh, we're doing the same thing here, uh, but now we're uh, normalizing it against not only the number of zones, but also um, sort of that zone types 0.4 exceedance or sort of consider that the design load, if you will, because we didn't have actual design load for every single space type. Uh, so we use that 0.4 exceedance um, from the measured data uh, to determine sort of this overall uh, diversity value. And so we did that for uh, each of the each of the zone types, um, and then we sorted uh, those loads um, uh, to be able to um, calculate them. Um, and the the diversity graphs um, that we're using um, are really looking at that um, going from sort of that um, maximum amount um, and watching it fall off. So we're finding the high the highest uh, zone uh, starting there, and then aggregating. You know, each step forward is taking that next set of the highest coincident load. Um, so this is where that uh, sort of diversity as a percentage um, uh, comes into play uh, and for each zone type. So again, this is kind of one of the big um, outputs. And um, to be honest, one of the things that was probably a little bit more surprising as a design engineer, because we're often not the ones who are um, trending data in existing facilities. Um, it's not shocking that if you have a very low zone count uh, down here in the two, four, six, you know, rooms on the zone, that your, you know, design load um, is likely the load that you should design around. Um, what, what what started to be surprising is that when we went into these higher um, zone counts and are still looking at the highest coincident load, um, we're often at diversity values down in the 40% range. You know, 40% of the total zone count load was what where you're actually measured. Um, and I'd say in a lot of cases from a design engineering standpoint, you know, we're often, you know, starting to, you know, when we talk about adding a diversity factor into a design, we might be sitting at 80% um, uh, for a high count load or high zone count. Um, in reality, what we're seeing is a very rapid fall off as the zone count increases. Um, and we would expect that to be similarly as we um, layer up multiple zone types. Um, and so, uh, I think there's room as we go forward as designers uh, to be able to react um, or maybe des design around um, more informed diversity factors. And I think 
uh, one of the big questions that came up from our peer reviewers um, was, okay, are you going to tell us what to do? And I think there's still um, still work to be done um, and specifically looking at a few more locations to just um, see how uh, these trends hold. And then going to the next level of doing the same analysis, but back at the air handler um, so that we can get a true sense of what the diversity values that we would be seeing at the air handler uh, relative to what's going on at these individual zone levels. Um, but the the fall off in in total uh, scene load um, was um, pretty informative. Uh, you can see here um, it's similar when we have less than 10. Uh, so zones where we had zone count less than 10, we still see that fall off. It's not quite as aggressive for all of them. Um, some of them are flatter than others, you know, which is to be expected. The ORs, for instance, um, don't fall off quite as much, and we typically are only at less than 10 ORs. Um, but there's still some uh, diversity uh, that we can expect, and these are, um, you know, a lot of operating rooms when aggregated, um, zero diversity is taken um, in that zone type. But what we can see is um, in a full year set of data, um, if we had the seven peak zones were um, measured, we're still at an 80% diversity factor. So again, as we get more data, if we do this analysis, this could inform uh, the design direction um, or sort of best practices for upstream uh, infrastructure. So um, air handler uh, sizing, um, could, uh, shaft sizing, uh, et cetera. Um, for when we have zones greater than 10, that fall off uh, was certainly more significant. Uh, so here we're going out to uh, rooms that we had more than 22 counts um, or thereabouts, definitely more than 10. But you can see that, uh, that falling away pretty consistently across all uh, all the space types and going down into the sort of that 50 percent, 40 percent, even as low as uh, down into the high 20s um, at those high uh, room counts. And specifically, you know, office uh, stations, again, this office um, office or staff workrooms, um, as well as um, I believe this is the, the um, nurse station, or that's nurse station. Um, exam and treatment, sorry, uh, consultation uh, spaces definitely increase when we're at those high uh, zone counts, definitely a, a much higher level of diversity um, than I think design engineers take advantage of. Um, specifically looking at the uh, patient rooms um, only, we also wanted to say, well, we also wanted to look at how does this data vary uh, between location? That was one of the big questions that came up from our uh, peer review. Uh, so here we've pl we've uh, uh, plotted out Modesto, San Leandro, and South Bay, so the, the three hospitals um, that we looked at. And you can see that the trend is the same. Uh, the um, sort of where it begins uh, sort of shifts at sort of what zone count. Um, but to be on the conservative side, um, if you're at, say, 16 patient uh, rooms, a 70% diversity um, is sort of the worst case that we saw, and the best case being um, the Modesto data where it was closer at 16 uh, room counts, the diversity factor was down at about 40% of um, the sort of design peak. Um, so we've included this table, uh, which is very similar to the table that Peter presented earlier, um, where this is kind of like, there's a ton of data in here, um, but it's looking at these diversity values um, for the zone counts. Um, so we have on the left hand side, you have your zone uh, room type, total count in our data set, the number of zones, um, the day and hour um, when that um, we had our max simultaneous cooling load. Uh, and that is also just one of our sort of QC checks uh, to make sure that that day and time made some sense. Um, and it certainly does. Um, you know, we see we see a lot of our coincident loads in um, in September when we have um, sort of low sun angle as well as high air temperatures in the sort of Bay Area. Um, but really, any of these summertime months, if any of these coincident peak loads had occurred in January, I would be uh, sort of question <laughs> the data set, but also go back to start to look um, again from a database retro commissioning standpoint. Begin looking at you know why is that occurring in a season where we wouldn't anticipate it. But we all we go ahead and we include the block load uh, for each space type, the number of zones that were in cooling during that simultaneous peak, um, and when that occurred, um, sort of the, from a block load standpoint, um, the zone peak. Um, so 
the 0.4 exceedance um, uh, value as well. And then the max zone type diversity um, that we saw from the whole data set is shown here on the right. So there's a, it's a very similar graph or table that we showed earlier um, uh, from Peter. Um, so I'm going to sort of wrap up and move into the Q&A session, but first um, just wanted to highlight where we think that this data, this is sort of a, the first round of what could be um, quite a bit of analytics or uh, future investigation. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, uh, when Peter was going through this sort of heat map of looking at an individual zone um, and when it saw its peak cooling, you know, there's a lot of things that we can gain from these visualizations. And if we did this for every zone, you know, this would be a zone, uh, a, a patient room that would sort of jump to mind saying, you know, why am I seeing my peak cooling for this zone in the winter in an off hour in the middle of the night? So this is like my zone is getting at peak cooling when it's the coldest outside and there's no sun <laughs> um, and, and likely very low occupancy uh, because of the, the nighttime scheduling. Uh, so this data set could be a really rich uh, data set to mine to find controls uh, issues um, and to be able to track through why a building may not be performing as anticipated. Um, so a big chunk of this is just sort of like highlighting problems um, and, and giving a targeted approach from a commissioning standpoint. Um, but also once we have this data and if the, a building is performing in a way that we think is, um, you know, anticipated, it gives us a chance to really inform um, our next generation of energy models and how we model those uh, future hospitals from a design standpoint. And so this is something that you know we've just started talking with um, with uh, Travis and his team uh, about. But once we have these characteristics um, and we have new projects, if an energy model is created, we can create similar graphics from the energy model and start to compare them against the historical data and try to highlight why they might be uh, different or why they might deviate from each other, and then identify what elements within the energy model inputs need to be adjusted uh, to get an energy model to more accurately predict how a hospital, uh, their energy performance is actually going to perform. Um, so we've broken out um, about six different sort of next steps uh, that we think uh, would be valuable um, if Kaiser thought so. Um, and obviously we'd be thrilled to keep working on, on this project and sort of expanding the impact of it. Um, as I mentioned, getting software alignment, sort of energy modeling alignment um, and adjustment uh, with the historical data. So that could be a future study where we actually build um, an energy model or take the energy model from the design engineer for a facility that we already have data for and start to look at what elements need to be tweaked within that model uh, to get the data to more or to better reflect the historical energy use and performance. Um, as I mentioned, database based retro commissioning uh, for just in, uh, improving energy performance at each of these sites. I really do believe that uh, retro commissioning would be m far more impactful um, if we are able to give sort of a target map uh, to the commission agent. And I think this database set of, of data really gives us some key areas to be able to point them uh, so that, that they're, they're not just using hot calls and cold calls and uh, performance complaints as a place to go look at, um, at performance issues um, or just doing spot checks, but really giving them the areas that we think are um, out of compliance. Uh, the third one is being able to build digital twins. So one of the things that we are doing on, um, on another project that we have a, a, a good set of data on is building a digital energy model twin of that project that actually allows us to um, investigate design changes or upgrades without doing them in the field first. Uh, so looking at, um, you know, say you want to do a, an energy efficiency project on the project. If we have a digital twin that we've calibrated to this real world energy performance and we think is really close, then we can actually test out those um, energy efficiency measures with a uh, pretty low cost uh, prior to doing them and getting a better idea of how they'll impact performance um, at a real world level. Um, we think there's a, a bunch of work to be done on uh, quality control um, and checking in those outliers, not just from a retro commissioning standpoint, um, but really checking on quality of data sensors, um, et cetera, and seeing if uh, there may be sensors that need to be calibrated um, or recalibrated, um, and that may actually solve some of the uh, controls issues. Um, and then I think a big one that we would love to work on is actually helping to develop a standard 
um, as part of the BAS specifications that Kaiser could hand out uh, to design teams and contractors that are that's far more specific on how um, the BMS or BAS is set up so that the data is much easier to um, pull out, you know, and that goes from, you know, a clear list of zone names that must be used and can't be deviated from um, spelling requirements um, and a, a check on essentially the pre the pre processing work that Peter did um, in support with June and and the and Sandy and the whole team at, at KP. There was a lot of pre processing work that needed to be ha needed to happen so that we could then automate the analysis with a little bit of upfront work on future facilities. A lot of that uh, pre processing actually could be um, avoided uh, by being a little bit more specific in the standard on how the uh, BMS contractor uh, implements the system. So that'd be a really fun uh, standard to help. Um, uh, craft. Um, and then lastly, um, Kaiser is participating with the California Energy Commission um, on energy efficiency within uh, hospitals, and we think this data could certainly um, obviously uh, be used to inform uh, inform that work. Um, so those are our key our key findings uh, from this first phase uh, of work, and I'd love to open it up to um, to questions uh, from the Kaiser team. So Steph, on the issue of uh, BAS naming conventions, uh, were you guys given access to our naming convention standard? Because there's been a lot of work on that. Um, we haven't yet. I mean, we've seen it as part of our design our design work. Um, so I think the the zone naming convention uh, is is really good. Um, I think going in the next level of um, of being able to pull that out in a very consistent way. Even sort of the um, uh, columnation uh, of that data um, and, and creating some standards around that, and even um, adding in sort of automatic outputs uh, where things are where the CSV files that you know June and 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 Ben were going in and doing uh, manually pulling out of Clockworks, automating that um, so because that could be exported automatically into um, a repository, and then if all that formatting is uh, has been sort of tip top the the sort of um, process that Peter went through uh, to aggregate all that data. A good chunk of that could be um, you know QC, QC'd still, but um, automated as well. And I think okay. these that'd particular be, that'd sites, be interesting to know because we we right now our requirement is that uh, any of our vendors use our standard naming conventions. Yeah, and what? I think uh, some of these sites predated um, or as your naming convention was evolving. Um, I think some of these as we are looking at different um, different building or yeah, the different locations, um, some of the sites had um, a little bit of difference. I don't know, Peter, if you want to um, sort of talk to how how a, a, the standard might be able to support um, a little bit of a cleaner process. Yeah, there's and I haven't seen any of the standards that uh, are being discussed right now, but talking about there's two kind of two tracks in, in terms of um, things that needed to be cleaned up. One was just the exports from Clockwork. So I think it was San Leandro just looking at all the zone export data. There were there were 11 different schemas um, that came out of Clockworks. So that, that means there was 11 different column naming conventions for all of the zones that came out of that. So I couldn't just say, look at this column name because it was called um, 11 different things potentially. Um, so that, and that was something that I, I didn't know about and kind of discovered, right? Um, that it, so for looking at the patient zones, all the patient zones were the same. And I, I don't know which zones it, it was, but it was just it was one of those things that kind of slowed down the process and um, the automation. And that would be helpful if they were all if you know um, the uh, zone supply air temp was all called the same thing, for example. Um, and then the other the other thing is just um, on some of that stuff that was manually put together. So what what is if we're grouping these by zone types and all that Clockworks provides is just the only thing we got from them. We were able to uh, derive the zone um, from the file name. So C A V dash O two etc and then tie that into um, what was put together manually and and 
is added into each each column by patient zones, for example. Um, and there were some kind of typos there, uh, so you couldn't directly join those things together. With, or you can, but then sometimes it failed and had to go in and manually change those uh, that join field, as well as some of the supporting information, just like what is that zone called and what are the other rooms in that zone. All those things were, you know, manually input. Um, so yeah, having standards you, for those, yeah. I suppose, you know, and, and that's that. I mean, that's painful for everybody, right? <laughs> um, and so yeah, that in an ideal world, those things would be cleaned up, and it would just. Um, it, I mean, it makes sense the first time that you do some of this work, you discover that, and, and but then it would be much more helpful if you want to scale this across uh, multiple facilities or multiple years, or just have to develop a standard moving forward. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's good input. I don't know that Clockworks is changing the name, so I think that falls more on uh, the BAS vendors. Yeah. Uh, that are doing that and that is one of our uh, our new kind of I'll call it acceptance criteria standards is to is to look more at the graphics and how the naming conventions and making sure that they are in in, lo in line with our standards so. yeah and then just talking about clockworks too I did a li I don't really know much about the platform I did a little investigation just via Google and it seems like it's I mean, and some of that's marketing stuff, but it seems really robust, right? And I would I would try to get as close as, to that data as possible, like try to explore um, something other than a manual CSV export, if you can connect directly to that, or or if they have a roadmap to allow an, to develop an API in the future to do that, um, that we could just directly access that data. Um, and because I don't know, you know, again, where some of like you mentioned who. I don't know where uh, that disconnect is on, on the naming or but maybe if we could just kind of more directly connect to it or or you could that would be um, that would definitely smooth things out I think. Okay good thank you good input. Yeah. Oh, uh, Scott this is Ben. Yeah. yeah. I know with the limited data that we have and uh, I know we couldn't use the diversity factor data that we have to size our air handlers or even the uh, coils. Mm -hmm. But given time when we could add more data, could we use or potentially use that diversity factor to size uh, capacities of our terminal boxes? Or maybe a size size the minimum maximum capacities of the terminal boxes i just want to relate yeah. to yeah the so data I, uh, and explain yeah. to the design engineer where he could use i know we explained on the uh, white paper mm -hmm. that we couldn't use that diversity factor for sizing our air handler but at least yeah give them an indication what they could limit the terminal boxes, right? Yeah, I think there's um, there's kind of two key things that I think would be really great to sort of move forward or keep looking at. One, you know, from the data, we see that almost all the zones are spending the majority of their time at their most sort of turned down load, if you will, the, the lowest load that they've been designed um, to. And in, in, in a lot of cases, you know, granted, some of these are, you know, uh, constant velocity systems, and so there's a ton of reheat um, all the time. But you know, we're, we're spending way more time at these low load conditions than I think design engineers are paying attention to from a performance standpoint. And so I think even the the box selections and designs and um, and control ability um, doesn't really match up with the performance that we see. So I think one thing is trying is sort of going forward from the data is um, sort of requiring design engineers to do a little bit more explanation and description of their design of how their design functions at these very low loads um, and how their their ability to control at these very low loads um, is going to be but the second one is i do think that the diversity factors could be useful for the terminal box sizing um, you know because those terminal boxes tend to be these you know single zone types all aggregated together you know say five six patient rooms you know that's something that you know this data is actually very I would say directly applicable for the hard part w w which we can't do yet because of the data set is like you mentioned looking at the upstream diversity factor when mm -hmm. we've aggregated say patient rooms plus corridor plus um you know some office 
we don't have that diversity factor um, measured, but the same process could be used. You know, we could take San Leandro as an example, grab one, you know, one air handler, track through all of all the boxes that are served off of that air handler, take the data off of the air handler, and we could actually start to get use this exact same process that we just did and start to look at well, if your load is if your block load is biased towards patient rooms and you've got you know a rough mix of this, here's something that we could anticipate from a diversity factor. I don't think we have a lot of that data as an industry mm. yet, um, and I think that would be a really valuable sort of next sort of phase is to look at well, what are the impacts upstream? Um, are there any savings that we could take advantage of upstream at the air handler? Um, and then the third one would be you know take that all the way back to the central plant. Um, you know, it, we, we, you guys have done quite a bit of work, I think, trending central plants um, and kind of knowing where they sit. And you might have boilers running all year um, at, at pretty high load because of all this reheat. Um, but getting an idea of where these diversity factors trickle up and can we, you know, better right size uh, some of the, the main equipment, um, it's kind of where I'd like to see this sort of line of, of research go. Okay. Thank you. So, so uh, another question, just in general. Mm -hmm. So with the data that we have and the results that we obtained, could we safely claim, because if you look at that 0.4 percentile data and you compare that with the block load, mm -hmm. could we safely say that we're over designing our systems? Um, there's we don't see that uh, point four. Yeah, you compare that with the black load. Well, that's too too far apart. So yeah, yeah. Um, right. So definitely the the point four exceedance load at the zone. Uh -huh. We didn't see. We didn't at each individual zone. We we actually think that that's pretty close. Um, yes. That the that the zone the design loads that engineers have been using and the loads that were experienced aren't that far off. Yes, it's one, yes. It's once you step up and start to aggregate those that the aggregate load, the block load, is pretty far off um, in yes, some cases. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and I think that's where we need more guidance to design engineers. Um, oh. Now, you're also going to get more pushback uh, from design engineers yeah, um, yeah, it, yeah. when you want, a, if you give them a prescriptive block load, for instance, to use if you have 20 patient rooms. Um, yeah. Because they're going to say, well, what if and what if? And we even saw that in the peer review. Uh, meetings and comments, you know, what if the blinds are down? What if the, you know, there's yeah. eight people visiting the room? Well, that likely occurred in the in the two years of data that, or a year and a half of data that we had, um, and the year that we really did a deep dive. That occurrence probably happened, um, but as an as our nature, design engineers are very conservative um, because we don't want a system not to meet load. Like that's our sort of uh, primary mission. But the the one thing that I think is worth looking at is for all those hours where we exceeded the 0.4%, it'd be worth going zone by zone and just taking a look at why. Why did we, you know, can we can we look at the data and see why we are out there in that far outlier? Mm -hmm. And was that a true load? Or was that a load that was induced because we have a poor control system that, mm -hmm. in, like, that overheated that space and reheat and then forced it into this extreme cooling mode for, for an hour? Because in that case, we may actually be able to be able to push back that the true 0.4% exceedance might actually be lower. Um, but we definitely saw in the data um, across all facilities, although San Leandro had was kind of a bonus case, um, we definitely saw areas where we think some of that load is fake, um, that it's not a real load in the space. It's a load that's been induced by the HVAC system um, because of a, a poor control and trying to hunt for a, a room set point. That's a great question. Maya, did you have any questions? I'm sorry, I wasn't. Oh, I'm, I'm good. Can you hear me, guys? No, uh, we can barely hear you. Barely hear you. No, no, I don't think I can. Okay. So let me ask, what do you think? 
what what do you think this means to <laughs> what do you think this means to decarb? So uh, one of the things we're going to do here is turn this data over to the decarbonization mm -hmm. project and to the Energy Commission and um, you know we have a lot of momentum right now or at least interest right now in this idea of decarbonizing healthcare. What is this? What are the implications here? Um, man. Um, so right sizing equipment is one of the biggest hurdles that we have on on decarb, especially in retrofits. For new construction, I feel like there's uh, less barriers. But on the retrofit side, you know, there's gonna there's going to be regulatory pressure soon on decarbonization retrofits. And the biggest challenge from a cost standpoint is, you know, a lot of engineers will go in, they'll look at the nameplate of your boiler, uh, for instance, and be like, okay, I need a heat pump that can do that. Well, doing a one for one swap for that load uh, with a heat pump is going to be crazy expensive and it's likely going to have massive ramifications upstream on your switch gear sizing, panel sizing, et cetera. Being able to take existing data and find what a real load should be will impact you know, the actual load that you see um, will radically change the size of that that replacement um, and understanding the simultaneous nature you know when we're looking at our data set and it's like heating cooling heating cooling understanding that simultaneous load um, in a really robust way can help pr uh, projects go and sort of drive towards you know heat recovery chillers and other strategies that are better suited and lower carbon uh, to meet those those loads in a sort of smarter way so better eui but also lower carbon emissions um, i think long term um, i would love to see changes to the way that we design um, healthcare facilities and especially patient rooms where we don't have huge latent loads um, and you know the supply air temperature that we're sending those um, you know we can push that up <laughs> quite a bit uh, for a lot of room types and and look at um, the benefits of going to more mild or supply temps which again once we narrow that sort of the supply temp range we have more options um, on the heating side and the cooling side. The closer we get those to neutral, we have more options for lower size, you know, smaller equipment uh, that has a higher efficiency. And so I think getting this real data could actually help us do better engineering on the sizing side that would al probably also make it more cost feasible. So maybe the follow up question of that uh, ostensibly. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm an MBA. I'm not really an engineer, uh, but but there's a thing called uh, competitive advantage among uh, firms. And every design firm believes that they provide the best service and are the smartest. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. And <laughs> we have the smartest people. We provide the best service. Uh, uh, and and unfortunately, uh, that is a myth kind of 99% of the time. However, at this point in time, Smith Group is the only firm in the country who's ever analyzed uh, load data in a in living hospitals right yeah so at what, scale right so what could what could you do with that that provides <laughs> more value than any other firm uh, uh, on today in history they're all going to catch up when we publish the video but uh but what, <laughs> <laughs> but what, what could you do with that right yeah I think there's a couple. Of, so we've already had sort of some internal discussions of like, well, what what are we going to do with this? Because like all of a sudden we have this amazing data set that we um, that nobody else in the country has, which is um, which is really exciting. There's two things that are, have come out. One, we want to go back and sort of look at how we model on the design side and our energy models, um, because every building is different than the energy model predicts. But I think in healthcare, it's wildly different. Like, it's not even close. Um, and I think being able to take this data on our future projects and actually have it as a back check to how we think that our, you know, our 8760 file coming out of our energy model um, is looking is, is a huge advantage of just being smarter about how buildings are actually going to perform, especially as we try to decarbonize and get to net zero energy on these large scale facilities. The other part is, now that we have a workflow and we have a methodology that we can use and the programming side has been is is very robust at this point um, you know we work with every other major healthcare 
um, entity in the country from Spanner to, you know, the UC system to whomever, um, they are not, a lot of the facilities are not as far as you guys are in terms of their uh, BMS, I would say quality of their BMS system. But for the facilities that are a little close, we could take their data and we could do, you know, system to system comparison, you know, climate zone to climate zone comparison. It'd be really great to take this same methodology out of just California and look at it in uh, the other regions that we have, um, you know, a lot of healthcare work um, and see what sort of differences we see. Because the one thing that I that I already hear um, and because we deal with this on our cross country healthcare work is well that's in california and everything in california is special and you guys eh. i hear that on every every meeting where i get pulled into something in dc or in arlington or or wherever but the data won't lie and i'd really like to repeat the same process in another radically different climate zone <laughs> um, or different part of the country so that we can look at how much variability there really is if we see the exact same trends on those interior zones, ORs, you know, imaging. If we see the exact same thing everywhere else and it's lower than what we're designing for, then as an industry, the competitive advantages would, for us is, well, we can go in and right size your system because we have a, a robust data set that tells us how it truly, um, you know, we think it's truly going to perform. Um, and, and that's a cost benefit, you know, for, you guys are just like every other healthcare entity. You guys are under pressure from a cost standpoint to drive down construction costs, drive down operational costs, and right sizing systems and getting systems to work um, are are really important to that. Um, I'd say the second chunk is I would really you know something that I'm very passionate about is building out this re uh, database based retro commissioning process. It's very sort of new out there from the ASHRAE world, you know, compared to a typical retro commissioning spot check to make sure, you know, your valves are opening and things like that. Being able to take very rapidly take an existing BMS and pour through it. And then we could work on setting up filters to be able to identify problem zones, you know, either through you know relatively simple AI of, of saying, hey, this is how we think a zone should perform based on this large data set. Oh, this one's not doing that. And, and that can flag that zone. I think there's a lot of work for sort of continual and retro based uh, uh, commission, uh, database based retro commissioning that this data set sort of sets both you guys and us up for being able to develop. If I could just jump in too, because you said so many things that they got me excited and we've talked about <laughs> this as well. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I agree, like if we were to replicate this, like for another site, we've done this enough that uh, we could do it really quickly. Although I, I would still argue, though, that some of this work is still exploratory, especially um, in the sense of looking at those loads and understanding. We didn't like we talked before, like let's dive into those individual zones and see what's happening. What are those outliers at those those early and late early morning hours, late evening hours um, in, in the winter um, or what causes that, you know, what specific hours for those zones are causing those really high exceedance uh, numbers. Um, so one thing that one direction I think that it could go is not being it's a lot of data, but it's still a snapshot of data at one time. Um, and even looking at the the comparison for the uh, those nine zones uh, for San Leandro, those patient zones there was actually I actually looked at 10 zones and one of the zones in 2019 was crazy. So I like threw it out. Um, like so in, off in, the charts. <laughs> yeah, in 2020, it was normal. In 2019, I don't know what happened in that zone, but there was something that just, you know, it, it was, there was something that it caused it to be an outlier, <laughs> and, and didn't, yeah. which I, you know, it's like the early um, data and the assumptions that we made about the five minute data, it would be, you know, cooling for a long time and then heating. And we saw the data and it just wasn't that. So um, if, if we looked at that data on a continual basis, I think, or went back went in the future, um, I would guess that it wouldn't look like everybody would expect it to look and we definitely learn about some behavior that was not intuitive. Um, and so maybe not it doesn't it, getting to the idea of like a digital twin or, or it doesn't have to be real time AI it could be periodic snapshots, but yeah. um, looking at something on more of an ongoing basis for operations to see how um, different zones are performing would be pretty compelling, I think. Yeah. 
All right. Uh, that was all I had in terms of questions. I guess I will just as a closing note before we stop the tape. I um, it was certainly our intent as the sponsor of the project that this be uh, that the, that this be the first project of its kind, not the last project of its kind, <laughs> and that it sort of moved the ball forward towards having more people. Even you know, I know I I hear that all the time too. By the way, it's it's true. Just for everyone outside of California, um, it, in California, we use spaces totally differently. Like our space <laughs> loads, we, we don't watch TV the same way. We don't uh, stand up and sit down the same way. We have different heat loads for the human beings. It's, everything's different in California. Everything's right? different, radically different. <laughs> and that's why you all need to stay out too. So. All right, uh, so I'll suggest that we stop the tape there. Okay, I'll go ahead and... Um... But yeah, we'd just like to share a big thank you uh, to Travis and the Kaiser team for um, we couldn't have done this work without you guys actually providing the data and cleaning, you know, that first phase. Um, you know, it's a lot of data for, that you guys pulled. So a big thank you for letting us play with it. Yeah, it was a great project to work on. Thanks, guys. And you were great partners in getting going back and forth was uh, was really easy. So thank you. Yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>